Thanks everyone uh, for coming to this talk. I'll be presenting some highlights of the state of um, AI report um, from Airstreet Capital. I'm Karina, and Airstreet Capital is a, um, a firm investing in AI, um, in early stage AI first tech and life science startups. And um, the State of AI report is an annual report that analyzes interesting developments in AI to in inform conversation. It covers research, industry developments, um, safety, policy. Um, and today I'll be giving a high level overview on uh, what you can find in this report. First of all, um, um, the general partner of Air Street Capital is uh, Nathan Banesh. He founded, um, he also founded RICE and London AI, an AI community for industry and research, um, and also the RICE Foundation, which funds open source um, AI projects. The team that has um, contributed to, uh, um, to the report uh, is us. I am a venture fellow at Air Street Capital. Uh, prior to this, I was an applied scientist at WAVE. Uh, WAVE is an autonomous driving startup in the UK. Um, yeah, and um, the, so the goal of this report is really to inform conversation and um, um, uh, the, the implications of, um, of AI uh, for the future. It has been reviewed by around 30 people. Um, to make sure that the, there's no misrepresentations or that there's um, no omissions, but of course, um, um, we're um, it's a living document, so um, we're open to to feedback um, on it. Um, so let's get started. Um, the first section is research, and to kick things off, I'll just mention that um, G when GPT-4 came out, it um, crushed all other LLMs. It has been um, generally regarded as the most capable general AI model. Um, this report came out in October, so um, I guess this doesn't include the recently released Gemini model. Um, and not only it outperformed um, other LLMs, it also performed ma many humans in, um, in, um, uh, in the bar exam, GRE, coding. Um, and what's interesting here is that uh, this model um, really showed um, what happens when LLMs get scaled. So there, there are these capabilities that emerge. So although the architecture is potentially similar to GPT-3, um, uh, the model um, had capabilities that were unseen before. And what, what, what was central to this was probably reinforcement learning from human feedback, uh, which kind of showed the importance of human labeled data. Um, and although it suffers from um, hallucinations, these are um, currently being worked on, or um, now the, the discourse is also a little bit changed to sort of say, well, these models, um, like, they're meant to hallucinate. So it's going to be an interesting space to see um, like what's next. Um, of course, the open source community responded to, um, to this, and there, there's a lot of excitement and um, a lot of advance, advancements coming from the open source, um, which, so for instance, um, a lot of um, smaller models, fine-tuned, for instance, LAMA on specialized data sets applied to lots of... Um, downstream applications, um, a lot of companies contributing to this. A few of them are uh, Mosaic ML, Together, uh, Adept. At the time of writing the report, uh, Mistral AI 7B model was um, uh, one of the best small models available. Um, what, what's interesting here is that um, this community also makes the model more, models more parameter efficient and uh, contributes to uh, better fine-tuning methods, so really helping uh, the community spread the, the use of LLMs so that potentially smaller companies um, can use uh, the models as well. Um, when Llama 2 came out, um, this was in July, um, it's, um, it, it's, um, it has been seen as the most um, capable open source model, um, and it pleased almost everyone with the um, with the terms for um, commercial use. So as long as the commercial applications didn't have more than um, 700 million users at the time of Lama 2's release, you could use the model. 
and in September it had 32 million uh, downloads. We also looked at the, the, like, the popularity of, of various language models um, on the y-axis, um, there's the MMLU score um, of these models and on the x-axis at the time it came out. Uh, and the um, size of the dot is the number of, is proportional to the number of mentions on X. Um, so you can see that proprietary models um, um, are, uh, I guess, are more, more popular online, but um, com um, open source commercial models come closely second, um, generally GPTs and llamas. Um, Historically, people looked at the number of parameters of a model as a proxy for the capabilities of the model. Not everyone would agree to this, but um, generally that was kind of uh, considered true. But lately, um, this, the, the conversation has shifted more around the context length of the model, so the capabilities are constrained by the size of the input. So there's been a lot of work in changing the architectures uh, to um, to cope with uh, memory and the compute required um, and to allow uh, for increasing the LLM context length. And at the time of writing this report, um, Claude um, had the longest context uh, with 100,000 tokens. Um, there's a few architectural innovations that we picked up on. Um, probably the most popular one is flash attention. Um, this um, improves the way that the attention matrix of the transformer is computed, and it allows for better parallelism and better work partitioning. Another one is 4-bit precision. Um, this allows the weight of the model to be quantized so that inference is faster. Another one is uh, speculative decoding, which allows to decode to tokens in parallel um, through multiple heads rather than doing a forward pass. Um, and swarm parallelism um, allows to train billion scale LLMs on poorly connected and unreliable devices. Um, there's um, also been some conversation around um, smaller language models, whether they can compete with large language models. And there's this paper from Microsoft that shows that um, um, very specialized models on curated data sets can rival a larger model. Um, this is, of course, a very, um, it's a very narrow domain, um, but it goes to show that like, the data that the models are trained on should not be um, overlooked. Um, something very interesting um, came from Epoch AI. It was a study that looked at um, the amount of data that these models used. Um, and they said that um, they, we have exhausted the low quality, we will have exhausted the low quality data used to train large language models by 2030 to 2050 and high quality language data by 2026 um, and vision data by 2030 to 2060. Um, so it's possible that other innovations might help with this. Uh, so for instance, speech recognition uh, systems like Whisper could make audio data available for LLMs going forward if this were to be true. Another way to generate more data to train LLMs is by generating synthetic data. Um, the answer is this is, uh, on this is not very clear because there's been, I guess, research, uh, research that shows uh, both sides of it. So for instance, um, there's one paper from Google that shows that if you train a um, model on ImageNet um, and, it, and then you train it on, um, um, on um, a synthetic version of ImageNet, so 12 synthetic versions of this image data set, and you generate them using ImageN, a text-to-image model, um, then this model that's trained on synthetic data outperforms the model that has been trained just on the original data. Um, of course, this is a classification task, so it might not hold for everything, uh, but it was definitely interesting to see. While other people say that um, actually, uh, introducing synthetic data um, ends up polluting the training set and um, it's um, th the way forward is carefully controlled data augmentation uh, but definitely the um, the case on this is not is not clear yet a very interesting 
um, area at the moment is um, agents. So LLMs are learning to use software tools. There's some works that um, were particularly, um, got a lot of attention. So for instance, Toolformer is a um, LLM from Meta that can um, decide to use, so it can use, um, it can decide which APIs to call, when to call them, what arguments to pass, and how to best incorporate the results into future token prediction. And from the um, open source community, similar models were, chat, uh, were AutoGPT and BabyAGI. Um, on the same topic of agents, uh, a model from NVIDIA called Voyager is, um, showed that through iterative prompting, LLMs can reason. And so what, uh, what they did is um, they used GPT-4 to produce code um, that can um, call the Minecraft API. So this LLM could play uh, Minecraft through code generation. So, um, and the model learned to acquire new skills in Minecraft. And um, so whenever the code would um, produce an error, they would just reprompt GPT-4 with the, with the error until it produced code that could be run. So um, Voyager learned to reason, explore, um, acquire unique items, in particular diamonds, which are quite rare, uh, quite hard to get in Minecraft. Um, and it also performed previous state-of-the-art models that were trained to play this game. Um, and it's not just, um, well, I have to say here that um, GPT-4 is very likely to have been trained on Minecraft code, so this might not hold for every game, uh, but it was definitely very impressive that an LLM can uh, play a game so well. Um, Another, um, the, the typical way of playing these games uh, has been through reinforcement learning. Um, although it is quite challenging to train, so um, in reinforcement learning you have to explore the environment a lot. This, it has a high sample complexity and it's quite difficult to put in prior knowledge into these models. Um, and a model called Spring um, was able to uh, beat and um, uh, to outperform an RL model uh, by just reading the, the game's original academic paper and playing the game um, through, uh, and just exploring through an, an LLM. So this area of research of using LLMs for planning, um, well, um, it's very interesting to follow because um, it looks like these models are, are outperforming reinforcement learning. And there's been years of research uh, that went into reinforcement learning. Um, LLMs are also going into the embodied AI space. Um, this model um, is a vision, language, and action model that provides driving commentary. Um, it explains uh, the, a lot of driving models are end-to-end, -end, so pixels to actions, and the, one of the criticisms of these models are that they're not interpretable, so you cannot know what the model is doing. And one way to address that could be through language, um, so Lingo1 uh, explains uh, what a driving model is doing, so it can be used, and it can potentially even be used to improve reasoning and planning. So going deeper into ro in, in, in robotics, uh, Palmy is a foundation model for robotics. It's a 562 billion parameter general purpose embodied generalist. Um, it's trained on very diverse data. Um, and it can control a manipulator in real time, and at the same time, it can also um, get state of the, ar of the art on a, a visual question answering benchmark. Um, and surprisingly, this model is better at, at text-only uh, text tasks uh, than pure language models. Um, in particular, um, it's very good at um, geospatial reasoning because when you trained it, there was robotics um, data in it. Um, another model, language model used for robotics is um, RT2. In this case, a vision language models is, vision and language model is fine tuned all the way to low level policies. Um, so these are um, robot actions, how to, contr uh, to control an end effector. And um, what's interesting is that um, if the, um, instead of only training on robot data, 
um, of trying to achieve this task, if you start from a, a model that has more knowledge about the world, so for instance, this internet scale training, uh, you, this enables generalization to novel objects. Um, and not only that, it can also uh, do semantic reasoning. So in, they have an example in which they show that um, um, being shown a bunch of objects, um, the, the robot can figure out what to use as an improvised hammer. And it might have never seen this uh, in the robot training data, um, but of course this kind of semantic reasoning is present on internet data. Um, and these models can't yet run real time, but um, I guess it is a matter of time. Um, a very um, exciting space is text to video generation. And this is, I think, uh, yesterday or today, um, Imagine 2 was um, released. And the, the race here is between two different types of models, one that are based on diffusion, video diffusion, um, and one that are uh, others that are based on masked transformers. And this, these are a little bit like uh, BERT, but instead of tokens, you have image patches, uh, but they're essentially trained exactly like language models. Uh, a very interesting uh, area of research that came out uh, or like resurfaced this year, um, I guess it is um, a little older, um, was uh, 3D Gaussian splatting. And this, um, competes with neural rendering um, uh, models. Um, and so what's interesting here is that they are able to learn a 3D scene from a collection of images, and it is now possible to render that scene from a different camera view um, at really, um, a really high speeds. Another very exciting area is combining NERFs with generative AI um, and um, I guess there's a lot of um, applications that uh, it not only require the creativity of, like, that Gen AI can offer, but require the geometry that neural rendering um, can offer. So combining both worlds can produce really, um, really um, interesting results. Another model that has been extremely popular this year was Segment uh, Anything. This is a promptable segmentation model that can, um, that can generalize really well to um, out of uh, domain images. So it's been, uh, it's been tested on 23 out of domain image data sets and it outperforms state of the art in more than 70% cases. Um, and it, is, um, it has an Apache 2 commercial license and is, is generally one of the best um, segmentation models available today. Another computer vision model that has been um, um, that has been released this year was um, Dino V2, and the why this model uh, so this model produces image features that can be used to perform a lot of um, a wide variety of tasks. So classification, which is an image level task, like what's in the image, to pixel level, so segmentation of images, um, and it was the first time that um, a self-supervised model um, provided features that are so good that they're comparable with weekly supervised um, approaches. Switching um, a little bit domains, um, MedPalm, uh, MedPalm 2 and MedPalm Multimodal, uh, these are models that can pass, um, they get a passing score on the US medical licensing examination. And um, um, there was this um, study on um, a thousand consumer medical questions where this model, these models' answers were preferred over a physician's answer by a panel of physicians across, um, across nine axes. Um, on, yeah. um, so to wrap up the research part of um, the presentation, um, I guess what's really concerning um, here is that a lot of this work comes from very few places. Um, and um, yeah, I think it's worth being aware that um, it, th this work mostly comes from the US and a couple of big companies. So um, how to open up research to other places um, would be um, probably worth looking into. 
Um, this is no surprise to, um, I guess, to people in this room, but um, NVIDIA um, um, had blow up earnings and entered the one trillion market cap club. Um, NVIDIA GPUs are used more than any other alternatives in um, research papers. So 31 times uh, more than FPGAs and 150 times more than TPUs. Um, and they have a very long lifetime value. So if you look at the most used GPU, the v V100, um, this model was, uh, this GPU was released in 2017. Um, and not only it's the most commonly used chip in AI research, but it could all, it, it peaked in 2022, um, which means that, um, for instance, the A100, which re was released in 2020, could peak in 2026. And this means that um, and, um, NVIDIA GPUs will probably be here for the next decade. Um, Airstreet also tracks the, um, the compute from private and public companies. These is, this is information that is publicly available. Um, A lot of companies are, um, are seeing a hit from the release of um, ChatGPT. This is just one example. There's plenty others, but um, for instance, um, on the day that, um, well, when, the, when ChatGPT got launched, um, Keg, a company that focuses on improving learning, um, has seen uh, an immediate hit, but that's not to say that these companies are not adapting. So a lot of, a lot of them are now um, pivoting to using AI. Um, and uh, for instance, Keg is now partner, partnered with Scale AI to build LLMs. Something that's um, worth being aware of is that a lot of, the, um, a lot of these applications like ChatGPT, Runway, uh, they they actually suffer from a low median retention. So that, that would be 42% um, median compared to 63% uh, when looking at other um, web applications. Um, so, I mean, thinking of uh, how, to, how to retain the active users, um, I think it's yeah, still an open problem. Um, so Hugging Face is seeing a significant momentum uh, or has seen a significant momentum this year um, in, in its attempt to keep AI models and data sets accessible to all. And um, over 1,300 models have been um, uh, submitted to, the, um, to their leaderboard and they had more than 600 million downloads in 2023, uh, in August 2023. Um, and this is probably going to keep increasing. Um, something that um, I guess it's, um, it, it's interesting to see is that a lot of the people who worked on the Transformers paper um, are now, um, I have started their own startups and, um, and they have raised um, collectively a significant amount of capital. Um, Gen AI investments are, um, are increasing. So um, without capital pouring into Gen AI, um, investments would have suffered, AI investments would have suffered a 40% drop compared to last year. And there's been 16 billion invested in uh, Gen AI um, alone. Um, however, a lot of these, um, a lot of this could actually be going to compute. So these, rounds, uh, particularly the ones raised by foundation models or frontier models, um, they require significant amounts of, um, um, yeah, of compute. So it's possible that this, they are trading equity for, um, for um, uh, yeah, the compute. Uh, finally, the last section of the report is um, on politics, um, although for years um, there has been a divergence in regulatory approaches, um, this year these approaches are kind of starting to stabilize and settle into three distinct, um, 
ways. So one would be relying on existing laws and regulations. Um, so others are looking into introducing AI-specific legislative framework, like a big example here is the EU Act. Um, and other countries are completely banning uh, specific services. Um, while the um, government, while governments are still um, making up their minds on regulation, um, a lot of the large labs are stepping in. So they are proposing, um, they're proposing regulation. And um, for instance, they're, they're meeting with policymakers and um, um, they started a frontier model forum where they um, kind of figure out what, um, what the best approach is for regulation going forward. Um, however, um, there have been concerns that um, a lot of these come from large players and it, um, it's possible that they will uh, control uh, uh, re like regulation in a way that favors them. Um, so it's important for, um, I guess, smaller players and the open source community to speak up about these issues. Um, there's an open debate um, about how to, um, to prevent um, misuse by bad actors on large language models. So um, I guess open source LLMs um, level the playing field for research and enterprises, but they come with the risk of proliferation, while closed source offer more security and control, but less transparency. Um, I think I won't have time to um, yeah, go into this, but um, it is unclear um, how to prevent malicious um, use, and it's unclear how to enforce this. Um, but we haven't yet seen um, a large scale pro proliferation of, um, of models uh, tuned for misuse. Um, something really interesting in the space is that two years ago, uh, there are very few people working on safety and AI alignment. Um, so this is just research from the state of AI team looking at how many people at each organization focus on AI alignment and in 2021. That wasn't that many people. Um, but fast forward to this year, uh, there's been a lot of uh, change in public discourse and a lot of um, yeah, a lot of um, scary titles in the media. Um, so definitely the um, AI safety debate got a lot of attention from um, figures in the government, from lawmakers, um, and um, I guess this just goes to say that um, AI um, is, um, is um, more political than it was in previous years. Um, and we also have some predictions uh, these ones, uh, these are these are the ones from um, last year, and some of them came true, some of them did not, and um, I won't go into them. These are the ones for uh, yeah for this year, and um, some of them are already looking like they uh, will um, come true. And I think that's it. This is all I had for you today. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, great report. I appreciate when people put out good knowledge. So um, maybe the next round of LLMs will read it and give us advice. So you don't have to answer questions for me. <laughs> um, yeah. There's so many layers to this. Um, there were so many layers before LLMs, and there's so many layers now. And you know, where would you say, uh, in your experience and perspective, is the highest growth market? Uh, which layer are we talking about? Are we talking about apps, SaaS applications, consumer, prosumer applications, or is it the engineering frameworks, or is it down to the infrastructure vector databases, or is it, you know, yeah. TPU, GPU? Yeah, um, I believe um, it's at the application layer that we've seen the most. Uh, I guess that's also the uh, the 
the easiest to build. So for instance, at the infrastructure layer, it's possible that um, there's not a lot of people that would be able to do this. So for instance, building on foundation models or building on um, yeah, models that just generally need a lot of compute, realistically, there will be very few people that are able to do that. So um, I, I think most, uh, yeah, most of what we're seeing is at the application layer, and this is, yeah, it's very exciting as well. Hello, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, I have a question. So you talked about the context length being like the new race, right? Yeah. Uh, what do you think about retrieval augmented generation, the future of it? So there is this uh, battle and some speculation with retrieval augmented versus fine tuning. Like why do we provide all this context? Should we just fine tune our models with our data and like not rely on the context that much? So do you think retrieval augmented generation is here to stay or do you think it is actually threatened by you know everyone just having their own fine tuned model? Yes, um, I'm actually not sure on this topic. So um, I think it, it's likely that uh, not a lot of people will be, like it's likely that it's easier to say, but I'm answering this with very low confidence. Um, it's not my area of expertise. Um, yeah, I, I do think, I mean, both, uh, both are here to say, like fine tuning will also be, um, I mean, we'll see more and more people fine tuning their models for their particular applications. So that's not going to go away anytime soon. Um, yeah. I would just add to that is that I think it's not necessarily an accuracy or, or um, accuracy versus, um, you know, uh, speed issue. I think it's a, uh, it is a speed issue. It is much quicker to add new knowledge and improve your model with, fine t uh, with, with instruction tuning with RAG than it is if you're gonna be going to retrain it like a frontier model with fine tuning. And yeah, it may be down to $500, but if you would say like there's a million customers and you wanna train f a million frontier models for each customer versus having data in a vector database, you're always gonna choose a vector database. You know, until it gets so cheap that the vector database is more expensive. I don't think it's gonna be an issue. So just, just following up with that, didn't you mention in one of your slides that you get the biggest benefit with fine tuning? Um, you had two components. You get the biggest benefit in fine tuning, but fine tuning is a lot cheaper than uh, using a RAG approach? No, I, I, I don't think I had anything on RAG and fine tuning actually in this presentation. Um, yeah. The other question I had was that um, you mentioned there's a break in the massive amounts of profits uh, for NVIDIA. I didn't yeah. quite understand that. There, oh. the, the evidence was that one is going towards equity versus debt. What does that mean? That um, no, I think, that, so to clarify that slide, it was more to say that um, a lot of the companies that are raising, um, I think it was this slide. Yeah, this um, trend might yeah, so break. This, I think to, to put it simply, a lot of the companies that raise, uh, raise a lot of money are paying these money to NVIDIA um, in order to train their models. So essentially, um, it is, um, they just need the compute, so they're selling their equity in order to get, uh, to provide, to be able to have access to this compute. Um, right, but they're trading off equity for debt. So does that mean debt is cheaper to them than equity or? Is equity oh no, that's, up? so that's a different, um, so that was the first statement that, um, and the second one is that it's possible that that's not the best way to do things and something else that came out this year, a new trend. So this trend might finally see a break. So there was, um, so CoreWeave raised a uh, 2.3 billion debt facility instead of with equity to buy GPUs. So it's unclear which way is better, but the, the second one is a, is a new way of doing things. 
Um, oh, I see. They don't want to. They rather borrow the money to pay for the GPUs, which is less risk for Nvidia, because they're not risking on equity. They might get nothing out of it. Yeah. Um, thank you for the report. It's very comprehensive. I'm just curious. Um, I know um, standard bodies such as ISO and IEEE, they are also working on AI stuff. Do you see the standard bodies play a role in this or not at all? Which standard bodies do you mean? ISO, ISO? like SC42, IEEE, they, are all, you know, they have all kinds of AI forums as well. And I'm just curious if you know, if you see them playing a role in AI development? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. Like, um, I, um, yeah, I don't know the impact of, uh, yeah. I, I don't want to answer the question, like, uh, yeah, incorrectly. 